Hey there, Dan Stu here. Today's video is about tying up a boat and is proudly sponsored by marineengine.com. Now, tying up a boat might not sound like the most glamorous subject, but it is really important. In my experience, the boats I've worked on that have been sunk haven't been sunk by driving in rough weather, they've been sunk by being tied up incorrectly. Tying up a boat correctly is definitely much more important in an area with a tidal variation because that's generally where the problems arise. If you're in a lake or some area that doesn't have a tide, it's pretty straightforward. There's obviously a few finer points that can still help, but most of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with tidal areas. Having said that though, what we'll do is we'll start by just tying up to a floating pontoon. Even though an area has a tidal variation, if the pontoon is floating up and down with the tide, you don't really experience the effects of the tide. So in some ways that's the simplest tie-up to do. The pontoon we're about to tie up to has a very standard, common sort of staghorn style of cleat. So we'll pull up to it and I'll just tie the boat up and we'll talk through some of the basics of that. This pontoon's got a cleat on both sides. And it's nice and easy to step out. I'm also keeping a hand on the boat. The last thing you want to do is jump onto a wharf and have the boat float away. When you go to tie the cleat itself, there's a few things I do. One is I keep about this much slack in the boat. If you tie the boat really tight up against the pontoon here, as soon as you get any boats coming past making wash or bad weather, it becomes a very harsh interaction between the two. So having just a little bit of slack really softens that and lets the pontoon and the boat move independently. Then when it comes to the cleat itself, I do a turn first around the cleat because this is by far the strongest part of the cleat and then do the figure eights like this. At the end, you can tuck under like that and do a little bit of a locking turn. Oh, got to keep cooling my feet off. It's so hot today. This pontoon's like a frying pan. Another thing I really like about these cleats is that it's relatively easy to hook one side of it. And that sort of lets you pull the boat in or do whatever you need to. Once you're hooked onto the cleat, it's relatively easy to get a turn around it. And what is surprisingly easy that you can do with very little practice is to just do these sort of little loose throws that just curl onto it. And then as it goes around the cleat, you sort of pull it tight to lock it on. That way you can get the rope onto the cleat without even really bending down. Although a lot of people prefer to do the locking turn, and I don't think it's a bad idea, you strictly don't need to. If you've got enough figure eights and then maybe even once around the base again, that's actually going nowhere. If you are going to do the rope flick thing, it's kind of a loose curl. You throw it quite loosely, let it hook under, then pull it tight to grab it. But before you do that, just have a look around because if there's no girls watching, there's really no point doing it. One other point worth mentioning is the reason I came in the way I did is because I want the bow of the boat pointing towards the prevailing weather. If I had come straight in and tied up, the stern would be out to the prevailing weather in the wash and you've got a lot more chance of the boat sinking just from waves hitting the transom and coming over. This way the boat will ride much more nicely, even in quite rough weather. Untying is pretty much the exact opposite obviously, so start the boat first, then untie your cleats, keep a handle on the boat so you can step on without it drifting off. If you can, it's always good to undo your last line from within the boat. The bow line here is a little bit tricky but I could definitely be in the boat here and still reach this cleat. So if you can, always be in the boat when you undo your final line. Once I'm here, I can easily reach this one from inside the boat. And then we can go. What we'll do now is go over to a fixed structure like a wharf. Now a wharf like this just stands solid on piles, it doesn't go up with the tide, and this is where you need to be really careful you get it right. A classic example of this is the public wharf at Dengar Island. If you intend to visit the island or tie up to any fixed structure like this, you need to get it right, otherwise you really can't leave a boat unattended for more than a couple of seconds, really. The technique we use at the wharf is to throw a stern anchor out to keep the boat away from the wharf to stop it going under the wharf, and then have a bow line onto the fixed structure itself tied onto the wharf. The basic technique is that you approach the wharf, you drop your stern anchor out as you're approaching, that way you don't have to throw it a great distance, you just let it out. Then as the boat approaches the wharf, the anchor road will sort of run over the transom. Because of that, you need to make sure the anchor road is coiled properly 
and that it can freely run over the transom. If it gets caught up, it's all going to stop. The boat will stop before it reaches the wharf. As the boat's traveling forward, I'm then going to go from the back of the boat to the front and get ready to grab onto the wharf and tie on. What I'll do is just show you how I do it and then we'll come back and talk about some of the finer points. As I approach the wharf, just go nice and steady, no more than one or two knots. So I'm now just running at idle speed. And then when I'm about, say, two boat lengths away from the wharf, I'll just pop it into neutral, head to the back of the boat, and throw the anchor out. Then back to the front, grab the bow line, and then grab the wharf. From here, I'm just going to tie on, do a bow line through here. Then what I'm going to do is come back to the back of the boat. Actually, I'll switch this motor off, save you the background noise. And then I'm going to pull this anchor until I can see that the bow of the boat's just level with the wharf and then cleat it off. And that's pretty much it, job done. What this means now is the anchor's stopping the boat from going under the wharf, and that will happen if the wind or the current's drawing it under, and obviously it means we're tied to the wharf, so the boat can't float away. You've probably noticed my anchor has a double rope on it, which is from there being a pulley, and what that actually allows me to do is to go up on the wharf and then use the pulley as a running line and pull the boat well away from the wharf once I've got off. If your anchor line is too long and the boat can reach the wharf, what happens is on a low tide, the boat can go under the wharf and then the tide comes up and, you know, at the absolute minimum, your bimini or whatever gets crushed. Worst case scenario is it actually gets pushed underwater and it sinks. Plenty of boats around here have sunk by ending up under a fixed structure. The tide comes up, they get squashed, they go down. Another really common way for a boat to sink when it's tied to a structure like this, probably even more common, is if somebody arrives on a high tide, at the moment it's quite a low tide, so there's about a five foot step up to the wharf itself. If you were to arrive on a high tide, the bow of the boat would almost be level with the top of the wharf here. And if you tie with a foot or two of rope and then leave the boat, the tide goes out, the boat will just start to hang and eventually the transom will go under the water, the boat will sink. Well, it'll dangle from the wharf, but it'll be full of water and you've got a taut line that you can either cut Either way, you're in serious trouble. So the main things are having an anchor so that the boat can't go under the wharf and having enough length on your bow line to accommodate for the tidal variation. In this case, I always tie to the very end of the bow line and the bow line is long enough to accommodate for the tidal variation here, which is two meters, plus give me a couple of extra feet for tying the knots and that kind of stuff. So this is the system we use and it works pretty successfully. When you throw the anchor and pull it in. You do need to be sure that the anchor is actually bedded in and it's not dragging. So sometimes what I'll do is then jump up onto the wharf, pull on the bow line, see if I can actually pull the boat in. If I can pull it under the wharf, then I need to jump back in, shorten the line. Having that dual rope system to the anchor and having a pulley at the anchor allows me to pull the boat away from the wharf from on the wharf. I used that technique in the Exploring the Hawkesbury video but I think down the track it probably deserves a video on its own right because a few people sort of said they'd like to see more about it and I'll definitely do that in the future as well. All right, now we'll go to another pontoon and talk about some of the other lines you can use to tie up a boat, notably springers to stop a boat moving forward and aft. To leave now, I'm just gonna start the boat again. Grab my bow line. Then I'm just going to start pulling this anchor in. You can't pull your anchor in first because you've got no way of dragging along the bottom. The whole idea is you can't pull it in. 
This boat here is Rosie, the boat that we went and picked up from Sydney Harbour in the video we went on Dave's trawler. And I'll show you what we've got here. Very similar to the pontoon we tied up at the start, we've just got a stern line here with a bit of slack, some fenders, and a bow line here going off to the front. What we have here, in addition to that though, is this aft spring line. Now this spring line stops the boat from moving aft. So you'll see here, it's tied off and then the boat can't extend. If we give it a shove, as soon as it tries to go aft, this spring goes taut and it can't go further that way. Now the main reason we do that here is that it keeps clear access for Smokey to come in. There are plenty of other reasons you might need to do that though. You might have other boats tied fore and after view and you're trying to stop the boat from banging into those other boats. Also, if a boat is moored stern to, like a Mediterranean moor, you can use it to stop the bow sort of swinging left and right, lots of different reasons. But it's worth noting that you can have two ropes to secure the boat to the wharf or to the pontoon, and you may need other lines to control where that boat can then swing to, and that's what your springs are for. Once you're back on the boat, the spring lines can actually serve a second purpose, which is to help you leave the wharf. An example of that would be if we had a spring going from the bow here to the wharf here near the stern. What that would allow us to do then is to put a bit of port helm on, go ahead, and without the boat actually moving forward, have the stern kick out, and then you could back away from the wharf. So if a wind's really blowing you onto a wharf, rather than scraping along it, you can use it as a technique to kick the stern out, let go of the springer, then come forward. It's already too hot, it's only like eight o'clock, but it's already too hot to be out in the sun, so we'll get back under the bimini, kind of. So springs are really handy for a couple of reasons. Now, it also brings me to another point, which is that ideally deck lines can be let go from on the boat. So if a deck line is secured to the boat, spliced on, and around a cleat on the wharf, unless it's a small boat like this where you can reach over, it's kind of not the ideal situation. With bigger boats, however, you tend to have deck lines with spliced eyes in them. That way, as you approach the wharf, you can throw the line onto the wharf, onto the, the cleat there, then you can cleat it off on the boat itself. That's got a couple of advantages. One is that if the wind's blowing and you haven't quite pulled up to the wharf, you can still throw it a metre or two or three and cleat it off, and then you can drive against that line to pull yourself into the wharf. And that's a really handy technique that most big boats will use. Then, when it's time to leave, you simply uncleat it from the boat, flick the spliced eye off the wharf or the pontoon or whatever, and you're on your way. Also, if you want to spring off that line, you can turn the boat towards the wharf, go ahead, kick the stern out. When the stern's out an appropriate amount, you can then just flick the line off the cleat, flick it off the wharf, and you're away. Because of that, no one ever has to be on the wharf and then jump on the boat at the last minute, which can actually be quite dangerous depending on the conditions. I personally quite like that system. It's not as appropriate for small boats, I'll admit, but I worked for a year as a deckhand to get my hours to do my coxswains years ago, and you do eventually get quite good at throwing a rope, and you can really save a bad situation if you do get good at throwing lines. So down the track, probably the next video, I might even film it today, I'll do a short quick tip video on techniques for throwing a rope, because I think it's something worth learning about, and it's kind of fun. Now moving to the other end of the spectrum, I'll show you how I've tied the green machine up quickly here. I was not away from the boat for long. I'm tied to a pontoon, so there's no tidal variation, and it's really calm. So given all those provisos, I think this is one of the quickest and easiest ways to tie up a boat. If you're just gonna jump ashore for a few seconds, buy some bait, get back in the boat, that kind of thing. And all I've got is a single, relatively short line somewhere about the midships. Because it's midships, you can't actually swing the boat. If it the bow tries to swing out, the stern will hit here. If the stern tries to swing out, the bow will hit here. The boat actually can't go anywhere. Now, granted, I've tied to my Bimini, which is a really flimsy aluminium strut. Not a great idea, but it's so ridiculously calm today, it was never going to be a problem. I've also used the line on that boat, which is cheating. What I see a lot of boats have, and that I will add to this boat one day, is a short line, maybe two feet maximum, tied somewhere right near the controls here. And what it means is I can pull up to a wharf, right up to a cleat, tie onto a cleat, step off the boat. It's the easiest, quickest type you can do. And if there's no tidal variation, and it's calm, and you're not gonna be long, 
It's the way I would do it every time for a quick tie up. All right, let's get moving. I need some breeze. It's gonna be 45 today. Much more swimming weather. Well, that's about it for this video. You can definitely talk for hours and hours about tying a boat up. There's a lot to it, but I think these are the main techniques that apply to boats of the size that most of the viewers of this channel use, which is smallish fishing boats. If you're tying to a pontoon, I think my advice is just leave a little bit of slack. Don't tie it rock hard against the wharf. You'll damage your boat, you'll damage the wharf, etc. If you're tying to a fixed structure, make sure you've got some sort of anchor that stops the boat from going under the wharf. And once you're tied to the wharf, make sure you've got enough slack in your bow line to account for any tidal variation that's gonna happen over the time that you're leaving the boat tied up. Obviously, if you're gonna be gone for five minutes, not such a big issue, but if you're gonna leave it overnight, very important. All right, well, take care. Feel free to comment and share your techniques for tying a boat. There's a million and one ways you can do it, very much dependent on the boat and the circumstance. And it's always nice to hear different ideas people have. All right, we'll catch you soon. See ya.